Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much for joining us here today. I have uh, the great pleasure and honour of having my good friend, Mr. Tony Moran in. Tony, thank you for coming. Nice to see you. Thanks nice for the invite. Um, the way I usually start these is with... Well, it's becoming a bit of a tradition. How do we know each other? I feel like I've known you for about 10 years, but I can't place exactly when we met. I know, yeah. It's you have connections with everyone. We have, we have the same connections, which is common in Liverpool anyway. If you're in the martial arts scene, you usually yeah. sort of know people and the security scene, but we never, we've only, we've only worked with each other recently on security, haven't we? So it'll be Steve Annigan. Steve Annigan. No doubt what do Steve. Big Steve. You've had Steve on the show, haven't you? I have, yeah, yeah. Steve was in. And also yeah. the two Lawrences we also got connections with. Yeah, yeah. Uh Eastman and, and Ken Wright. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna have Lawrence Westgaff in eventually. Um but yeah, it feels like I've I've known you for a very, very long time. Um the other thing I usually ask people about is the experience of being in Liverpool and being from Liverpool. What do you make of this city? What do you feel about this city? Can I just make a point before we start? You can do whatever you want. <laughs> if my feet are on camera, yeah. I have got socks on. Have you? But I'll just be in on holiday. Okay. The house is getting... Um, can you see his ankles? The house... The, you the, the, you the house is getting... Um, can you switch to the wide? An extension. I've got no I've got no current uh, washing machine facilities. Yeah. And I've got my bird socks on. You've got your bird socks yeah. on. This the, is some but very... The little, the little socks. This is very niche pornography that we're so making. So I'm, like, I'm not sitting here like a scally scouser with old socks on. You've got birds, birds I'm ankle high socks correctly, but yeah. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm a fan of the ankle high socks. And then people can have a little look at your ankles at the same time. It's fine. But now... So I, did, we... I did try and make an effort, but unfortunately, I've only got I've only got clothes on the suitcase and this is all that I had left. So I should make that clear. <laughs> now we know. <laughs> Uh, so the question was about Liverpool. Yeah. And what? Sorry. What? What was the question? Well, I've been asking people, sp uh, sp so far, people from here, what they feel about the city and what they feel makes the city different. You, whereabouts in Liverpool are you from? I was raised on Shield Road, Kensington. Um, but yeah, to be to be more specific about your question, I think we're a very, in many ways, a very spiritual city, and I think that comes from the history of the genealogy that's passed through the city. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a well port. There has been a well port in the past. The amount of um, different cultures and, again, genealogy that's passed through this city, that's still part of us all in many ways. Mm. I think we're a very uh, unique city. Mm. I think we're a very rebellious city in terms of the the ways that we interact with the powers that be in terms of how we are willing to accept and um, maybe suffer the consequences of that of the rebellious nature because it, it does come at a cost at times and that has come at a cost and I've seen that cost growing up. Um, is there a cost today? I don't know because I think most people have sort of become very comfortable and switched off a little bit. Did, did you notice during COVID, maybe I'm paranoid, but there seemed to be a lot of things that were rolled out in Liverpool first. As, like, as a test, yeah. As we're, a test. We're, we're, like, we're like the guinea pigs, aren't we? Because if we, if we accept it and we suffer it, then I think we're a good, we're a good yardstick for the rest of the country. Mm. But that was highlighted by some prominent people mm. yeah, during that time. Again, no... I think what my personal view is that a lot of people have become quite softened by materialism, quite softened by the way the world is currently. And you know, people you do see it, people have sort of switched off to the, I'm from I'm from the seventies, so I'd still say my era is still quite active. Mm. Um some of the younger generation are quite active because because I do I do interact with a lot of the younger younger generation of uh, what you consider people who are actively involved in what you consider injustice. Mm -hmm. um, so with, there's, still a, there's still a strong sort of um, mindset. And I, and I believe under under the facade and under the, the illusions of what we consider life to be, which is the material life and what you can get and what you, 
what you've got to aim for in order to be accepted by your peer group and all the, all the nonsense that I consider illusions. Is that I think underneath that there's still a strong spiritual strength of 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 righteousness, mm. of fighting against injustice. But I think it takes a lot of I think it takes a lot more rallying nowadays for people to I think it's gotta be in people's faces now. Right. I I actively go looking for it. Yeah. Um because with the way with the way the world is online at the moment, you got you, you can live in ignorant bliss if you wish to, if, mm. you, if you choose to, but you can also do the opposite and get more information nowadays mm. readily available at your fingertips than mm. ever before. So if you if you choose to be ignorant, then that's your choice. But also on the flip side, if you want to really, really look beneath or behind the veil of what's going on, then that's, that's possible as well. Mm. So getting back to your point about Liverpool is that we're st- we're still up there, in my opinion, with with regards or in comparison to other parts of the country, mm. which and maybe some parts have just switched off completely. Yeah, and it's just people have just become so desensitized and so so used to injustice that it's just become common, and it, it shouldn't be like that, in my opinion. But it's what your own soul should be saying to you. It's what your soul is saying at this moment in time, this moment in history. What's your soul saying to you about what are you prepared to do in order to stand up and 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 do what's right? So, so you think there is a natural, innate uh, desire here, particularly to be rebellious, to challenge the dominant narrative, to look for alternative explanations, but maybe it's fallen asleep a little bit. Maybe people have succumbed. yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I know yeah. I went a bit off, bit a bit off track there, but. I was just trying to make a point that I think people need to try and recover maybe what we've had in the past here. Mm. And it was a strong sense of community, a strong sense of spirit, strong sense of righteousness and justice in many ways. But time, time and pressure and everything that's got, not just the last two years, let's be honest. Not, yeah. this, this city has, has been under the cost for a long time. Mm-hmm. And let's be honest, there's a lot of evidence to prove that this city was earmarked for, I wouldn't say total destruction, but it was earmarked and there's, there's papers you can read to prove mm-hmm. the fact that the governments were highlighting and targeting this city mm-hmm. for, I can't remember what the phrase was that they used. It was, it was like social and economic destruction. Really? Yeah, and there's papers that you can read. They wanted to dismantle so, it. Um, but it was earmarked, yeah. Mm. Margaret Thatcher earmarked and targeted this city. Mm. I think it was Michael Heseltine who came in and sort of, uh, if I remember right. I can't be I can't be completely factual on this, but I know I've read a lot of a lot of information, and and we thought are correct, but I can't mm. give you mm. detailed detailed information what I'm trying to speak about, but. Mm. It was it was earmarked for them. And do you think uh, that that the sort of the the social experimentation where we saw you said it was it was used as a yardstick to see what people would comply with um, that would only happen if it had been identified as a place where there was a certain sense of rebellion, where there would be a degree of like pushback. That must be the case. It's been uh, over the last two years. I, uh, over the last two years particularly, yeah. 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 Um, I'm sorry, what did you, what, what did you... Yeah, if it, if it was identified as a place where you would target for that, then presumably it's been identified as a place where, re- where they would expect a degree of rebellion to come from. Hmm. And there was rebellion over the past two years. I was I was out there actively involved in, in everything that was going on, but it fluctuated. Mm. The numbers fluctuated, the the amount of people interest. It got it gets back to what I'm saying before. It depends on the person's level of I was directly affecting that person. Mm. Um no, me personally, growing up all through my life, I've I've never I've never turned my eyes away from an injustice. Mm. Um whether it's been through the work that I did, and I did a lot of I did a lot of work in in Liverpool that was working at the very bottom strata of of economics for people for and damage for for society. Mm-hmm. I worked in the homeless service, so I I seen 
I've seen catastrophes on a daily basis of people's lives. You've worked in the community you've worked in for a long time, so you'd understand that fundamentally damage occurs as a child and it continues right to, to your life if it's not dealt with. So I'm going off track again, I know, but um, I just think personal responsibility is something that needs to be reset mm. for many. Um, social responsibility needs to be reset for many. And as proud as I am to come from this city, I would just like to see more people standing up. As much as they do for sporting events, as much as they do for things that, let's be honest, fundamentally got no importance in comparison to the things that are going on in the world right yeah. now. And there's a lot of dark, let's say demonic shit going on. Mm -hmm. And people just seem to be just like, Boop. yeah, Boop. don't want to talk about it, don't want to listen about it, yeah, don't want to speak about it. And I'm like, and a few others that I know well, you're like, why don't why don't you? Yeah, are you not? Have you, you know, you're not a human being with a soul. Have you I got no heart. Have you got no compassion. Have you got no? Have you got no sense of right and wrong anymore? Mm. So, f coming from this city, again, I'm, <laughs> I'm proud to be from here, but um, there's, there's too many asleep at the wheel now for me. I, th I think it's fair enough to say that like you're proud to come from the city and maybe in some ways, uh, like me, I sort of, I have similar criticisms and I think I expect more. I yeah. expect more from people. That's I'm like, I, put on it. I know, I know we've got more than this. So I do get frustrated when I see that we've, it's always been a showy place. Like if people have something, yeah. they'll go with the flash and the bling. Yeah. Bravado and that, that's fine. Where I see it, where I see people falling asleep, where it numbs them and then they're not active anymore. I'm sort of looking, I'm going, no, this is, this is not, this is not good. We're now moving into a bad direction. So for all of the, the sort of the pride I feel for, for the exceptionalism of the city at the same time, at now in 2022, I have the same level of criticism, but it's because it's coming from a place of going, no, I know that we can be doing better yeah. than this. We're not doing enough. We shouldn't. I don't want us to become just another city in the UK. Same what, as, what's same it going to take for people to say, hang on a minute. Now, people have sort of done that a little bit over the two, but it depends on what, what carrots being dangled in front of people, doesn't it? Mm. What, what, what are we going to dangle in front of you to stay quiet? So, mm. so people who are in, can I take this jacket off? Yeah, go ahead. People who are in the benefit system, be it alcoholics, drug addicts, all the associated factors. Mm -hmm. So I worked in that industry for 25 years and I know that people are paid essentially to be quiet. Yeah. So we'll we'll furnish your addiction needs with, with quite quite high levels of money. So the worse your addiction, the worse your problems, the more money you got to feed those addictions. So right. the, it, there was no cure involved. It was all just dealing with the symptoms. Right. But that keeps people disassociated, to keep people desensitized, to keep people not functioning. People aren't functioning very well at the moment. I want um, to go on. And it's pre-planned in my opinion. It's all pre-planned. It's all it's all well ordered. It's mm. all well organized for the masses. Mm. I'm one of the masses. I'm no different to anyone else, but it's just that I've made that choice throughout my life, I suppose, to, to stand up. Mm. the things that I don't see as right. I know what right and wrong is. Mm. I know what injustice is. I know when someone's suffering. I know when someone needs help. I know when someone needs compassion and care. And we're all human. We all understand these things, but I suppose most people just want to stay in Chile with their, with their own little nucleus. And I get that. I understand it. And I suppose... Um, I suppose because my the way my life trajectory has gone and I've I've learned sort of warriorship to martial arts and I've become I've become a little bit stronger. Mm. I've become I've become more resilient. Not just with with the combat side of life, but with life in general. Do you know mm. what I mean? Suffered my own adversity. Whether I say the word suffer anymore is probably the wrong way because I don't see it as suffering, I see it as, as a blessing now, but at the time you're going through it, that's how it feels. But when you look back, it becomes a, it becomes a blessing in your life. But 
I don't want to judge people too harshly because I understand that there's a lot of damaged people, mm. not just in this city, worldwide. You know what I mean? There's a lot of there's a lot of damaged souls, but um, maybe it's just maybe maybe it's just time that people need to stand up now. Because I think it's an all or not on cyber time now. I really I agree. do believe that. I believe we are we are at the. <laughs> I believe but at potentially the end times or potentially the beginning times or something mm. better because when I work on the doors of a weekend where you've mm. worked with me mm. I look around and think this can't be this can't be the pinnacle of human evolution what I'm seeing here <laughs> can't be <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying yeah, by that? Do, yeah. the way people are acting the way people are behaving the way people are it's just you're just looking at thinking this is like the fall of civilization going well, on here. That's this what is I'm, the fall of Rome again that's what I'm talking about I'm worried that the city's losing its soul and when I was doing the, the the security work with you, I was looking at some stuff and I'm like, as men age, as, as humans age, we all go, oh, it's different when I was younger. It's different when I was younger. It fucking was different in the 2000s. It wasn't like this. There's a there's a cynicism and a soullessness. Soullessness, yeah. That's crept in to the culture. And I'm like, I, it, it feels like a rot to me. And um, I'm, 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 I'm actually really worried about it. I'm really worried about it. I'm like, this, this in another 10 years, might not be the city that, that I previously knew. The city or the world. <laughs> okay, good point. Good point. Yeah, because the world is going in a certain direction. Um, oh, there's a lot of topics you just touched on there that I do want to bring up. In order to contextualise uh, you, could you tell us a little bit about uh, where you grew up, how you got into martial arts, your your journey? Okay. I'm a bit reluctant to, but but I will because you've asked the question, and I sort of I sort of give an indication of who I am as a person, I suppose. But I don't want to go too deep into it. Okay. I don't I don't want to make this a podcast about my glory stories or do you know what I mean? As 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 much so as, as much you as, want. I, as much as I've been sucked into the the world of ego in the past. Yeah. I think I was always aware that I was where I was got. I've always had I've always had uh, boundaries. Yeah. I've always had an awareness. And I've always had the blessing of good people around me who've instilled the correct values, which again is important for anyone. Um, so I've been blessed in that way. I found martial arts by chance. I was, I was growing up in a very socially, economically deprived area. There was absolutely no sort of um, pot of gold at the end of my rainbow. It was... It, uh, was it tough? I, I don't remember my childhood as being a tough childhood. I remember as being quite an enjoyable one. But I was still aware of what was going on around me. But I was sort of impervious to it because I, I just didn't buy into it. So from a young age, I didn't buy into the illusion. But also, it's around me on a daily basis. And I've, I've got to play around with the peer group that I'm in. I've got to, I've got to try and survive. You know I mean? And this is... I was going to say this before. This bit, this city, in many ways, is built on that survival instinct, mm -hmm. fight or flight type of place, mm -hmm. do or die. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And society all around, the culture all around, it, it's it's it all. You suck it in, and you become mm -hmm. it becomes party a little bit. But there's a party that maybe if you if you if you're blessed, like I believe I was blessed, that I had I had. I had a resilience to it. I didn't fully believe it. I didn't fully immerse myself in it, even though I played a part in it at times. I just, I had, I had something, I had something to buffer it. Mm. Now, whether that was the family upbringing that they had and, and the beautiful people I had in the family who, who were non-materialist, they were, they were, they were seemed egoless. They seemed, they just seemed good. They just mm. good souls, but. I went and then went into the combat world, and that's probably where I got sucked a little bit away from my family beginnings because my family and the people in it the very pure people mm. i was i was raised <laughs> but <laughs> pure and you know, the pure i wasn't mm. but they were like that but mm. they were pure in the essence of hu yeah. of the humanness yeah. towards other people they were good people they were soulful people they were just decent people mm. and, I, and i'm that type of person but then i went into the combat world and i got sucked into the the bravado and the being a tough guy and how, how old because that's you? how you made your way in the world where I was from. <coughs> that was essentially the only way you made your way in the world. Mm. You're either capable as a fighter mm. or as a football player. Mm. They were your options. 
I wasn't that good as a football. I never really saw myself as a football player. I probably would have made a good goalie. <laughs> but um, so fighting was my thing. And then I started getting respect as a fighter. Then I started getting the kudos and the mm. all the associated factors that come with being a fighter. And I was a good fighter. And mm. I've, I've had a 30 year career as a fighter. How old were you when you started? 12. And what, what did you start with first? Karate. What style of karate? So I had a karate career, I had a kickboxing career, I had a martial arts, uh, a mixed martial arts career, I had two full-time boxing careers. T t tell me about your karate experience. You were 12. What what style of karate were you doing then? It was called freestyle. Freestyle. So here's a good story to add into it. Because mm. I'd like to honour the people as well mm. who I consider have been a part of that path from a life that I wasn't fully understanding at the time because it, it, it didn't seem to make too much sense. And then the people who I've, I've used as my sort of inspirations, because uh, I did well as a combatant as well. I was I was world I was a world renowned karate mm -hmm. uh, competitor. I was world renowned in the boxing. Mm -hmm. for, so four for world titles, I've won world titles. I've done a lot in mm -hmm. 30 years. And 30 years is a long time as a combatant, by the way. Mm -hmm. So from the age of 12 to the age of 42, mm -hmm. I virtually didn't stop competing mm. in all those different disciplines. <coughs> so it's quite a rare thing to be a combatant for 30 years. But I was. Mm. Uh, I, I was very, I was very much um, uh, dedicated to, to the competitive side of it and all mm. that goes with it, mm. which is a lot. Irrespective of work, kids this that the other mm. and i seen it through to the end mm. <coughs> i finally won a fringe world boxing title at the age of 42 as mm -hmm. a professional but my first title i won was when i was in karate at the age of 13 14 with, with won my first british karate title so from beginning to the end i was i was i was doing well with uh, the uh karate that you started out with the freestyle stuff so when you're competing is that it's like uh, you'd have hand pads, shin pads on, and you didn't have shin pads on. No, P punches and kicks to the body, but not to what, the head. What these like sort of mitts? And yeah, these foot, these foot pads. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I think Chuck Norris. <coughs> um, I think um, there's been enough. There's been enough karate. For yeah, me. yeah, yeah. There's, there's loads. Last one. But yeah, so. Getting back to where I was trying to explain the inspirational side of things. So mm -hmm. Alfie Lewis, no Alfie Lewis? Yeah, yeah. He was a five times, six times world freestyle karate champion. Mm -hmm. So back in the late 70s, early 80s, mm -hmm. him and his team from Toxic, they were, they, they were world renowned players on the karate scene. And he sort of, they were sort of the mixed martial artists of the day. They were, mm -hmm. they were prominent, they were prominent individuals. And he got a lot of praise for the for their abilities and the toughness and all this thing. And I used to have a picture on my wall of Alfie when I was like twelve from a martial arts magazine. Mm -hmm. No social media in them days. Yeah, yeah. The magazines from the shop. Yeah, it? yeah. Picture of Alfie on the wall. I was living in a very sort of decrepit terraced house in Kensington. <coughs> <coughs> my name was Bear. It was just, you know, it was economically wise, it was tough. But there's this man on the wall mm -hmm. from Liverpool. And I want to be him. Mm -hmm. I want my life to go on that trajectory. I want to be a champion. Mm -hmm. um, and I made that happen. So someone like him was my first inspiration. And then I got to train with Alfie, become my coach. So I believe I believe in law of attraction to a point where I believe you can sort of create your own reality. Mm -hmm. And at that age, I wanted to be a fighter. Mm. But I couldn't. I didn't know I could fight. By the way, I was raised in a gentle household, and there's no men around me who are fighters. Mm. So, am I going to get from this point to that point? And I just, I made it happen for myself. I found a place to go, and I found a place to train. Mm. I found a way to suffer what I was going to suffer, which was a lot of hurt in a physical way. But I knew that that at that young age, I knew that's where I needed to head. That makes sense. And were you training with Alfie then, or were you training in a different? No, he was based. He was based in Tokyo, and I was, in I was a Caucasian based in Kensington. Does that mean you couldn't? There was just no way. Soxters was a bit of a no-go area at the time. Okay, so that's the way it was put across here. 
Yeah. I'm saying that's how I feel now. I'm just saying that's how that's how <laughs> that's how it was demonstrated in the media. That's how it was yeah, demonstrated yeah, yeah, yeah. by people around you. Yeah, yeah. And it's changed now anyway, hasn't it? What? It's changed anyway. Yeah, massively, yeah. Yeah. It's not so, it's not like the seventies. So I did, but 20, I didn't know that. Twenty one is when it started saying the all fees. But so just, just one second though. So so at that because that's an interesting point. At that time, as a young karate student, if you really wanted to train with Alfie and Toxteth, there was just you, there was just no way. You Unless you were from Toxteth and felt comfortable and so, so okay. Toxteth was portrayed as this terrible place. Mm. Could Toxteth riots? When were the Toxteth riots? Was it early seventies? I think early eight. So I was a kid watching on a telly. Oh, okay. So it's early eighties. I'm just a kid. I've got yeah. no. I've got no sense of the yeah, world, yeah, yeah, true yeah. world at that time. Yeah. Um. It's like my what my parents went trying to. Uh, Dissuade me, by the way. It was just, mm. it was just, just, it was just the feeling in general. Yeah, like yeah. You didn't go to Toxford. You yeah. weren't welcome in Toxford type yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, but by the time I was twenty, I was, I had my own awareness of the world, and that wasn't a problem for me. Yeah. So that's when I went to train with Alfie. So the man who was on me wall at twelve, yeah. at the age of twenty-one, he's you went not down. my sensei. And were you going to Toxford by that age and training with him? <laughs> yeah, I was. Like, I was fearless by then. Yeah, you're, right. ready, you're ready to I go worked, into I worked on Gran, I worked on Granby uh, in Granby Housing for years. Did you? Yeah. So as 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 your life develops and as your awareness of people develops and as your, your understanding change. of cultures yeah. develops, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. we're all we're all from where we're from. We all yeah. have to learn, don't we? Yeah, yeah. And you only learn by experience. Yeah. So um so then I'm saying with Alfie and then just develop from there and then I just become I just become a very capable competitor as a combatant and then So so the actual martial arts trajectory, if I'm getting this right, it was karate first. And then once you started training with Alfie, because he was kickboxing as well, wasn't he? A bit of both, yeah. And is so, that... It sort that, of morphed into... So you'd... Karate had gone into the kickboxing and the... Yeah. So you went... For, it, was you, like, it was like the, the start of the martial arts, mix, mix, mixture of different different styles and different... And shows putting on tire boxing, kickboxing, mm -hmm. K1. You know what I mean? How long were you... Everything was morphing into one. Right. Right. This before mixed, well before mixed martial arts, by the way. How, how long were you training with Alfie for? There from twenty one to twenty six. Right. I'm done well there. And what what were you were you competing in karate at that time? Free, yeah, free, so Al, freestyle. Alf, Alfie was the originator of freestyle karate. Oh, did he create freestyle? He was the originator. Karate. Of it, yeah. Oh, okay. Freestyle okay. karate. Well, I could be wrong there. Maybe yeah. maybe a foot, but I'm pretty sure I'm right on that one. Yeah. Pretty sure I'll but at least in this country anyway. Yeah. He was the originator of freestyle karate, which was a more flowing form. Yeah. And that's the type of form of karate that's done well in mixed martial arts. Right. Because right. it flows and it's it's hard to counter if you don't understand it. Because it's very fast, it's very explosive. So from from sort of thirteen to twenty six, uh you were you were competing quite a lot in so freestyle. When we first bit of title at thirteen. Mm -hmm. And consecutively from that age until the age of 26 as an adult, mm. I was British karate champion. Wow. We also represented the Great Britain squad on many occasions, won mm. the world uh, team gold at one of the world championships. So you travelled to other countries on yeah, the British team? fought and travelled around Europe and stuff. So it was a good experience. Amazing. But there was no money in it. No. So then I wanted to try my hand at professional combat sports, which is why I went into professional boxing. So boxing at age twenty six, you twenty eight. I was twenty eight. You said boxing now. And who did you start training with when you started doing boxing at twenty eight? So because of that, I didn't have any amateur boxing matches as, yeah. as an amateur boxer. Right. So trying to get trying to get a professional coach or trying to get a professional manager or trying mm. to get a professional promoter mm. when you've had no experience as a, mm -hmm. as an amateur boxer. Yeah. You basically getting laughed out of people's offices. Yep. Which it, I did. Yeah. I'm gonna say. They weren't laughing in my face, but I could tell that they'd be humoured by the fact that yeah. at 28 hours. Yeah, in the boxing world, that's just not a thing, is it? You do, you know what, do, it. do you know what I've decided I was going to become a professional boxer? Go on. Is it An Anthony? Who's the, who's the motivational speaker? Anthony? Anthony Robbins. So I read a book. I was, do you know when you talk about these Lord of Attack? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I was working in the homeless service. Mm. I, I took a few of the homeless people who, who I was sort of... Um, I was sort of their case manager. I took them to this place to, to do qi gong. Qi gong, yeah. Qi gong. So I've always been a bit of a seeker me, looking for new things to yeah, try yeah. and develop my spirits and stuff. And the people who I 
the way we sort of case managing the homeless centres. So we used to bring them to the gym. I used to try and try new things with them. Yeah. Try and develop them as well. Yeah. But develop myself. So in my early twenties, I was meditating. I was doing the cold. I was doing cold water therapy before when Moff was doing it. Right. Going to waterfalls, <laughs> jumping in waterfalls. Yeah. Meditating, doing yoga. Yeah. Doing all these things in my twenties. So we're yeah. talking like twenty five years ago now. Yeah. And the qigong, mm. so I was trying to, I was trying to open me, me spirit up to new, to new experiences. So mm. I was reading books like Emotional Intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, The Road Less Traveled. Mm -hmm. So these things were like sparking, not, not an awareness in me. I think they were sparking uh, a remembrance of who I was. Because mm. I remember being a very spiritually minded child. Mm. I remember being very uh, connected to the world and to other people. But I sort of lost that. And then in my mid-20s, early to mid-20s, I started reconnect. And martial arts was a massive part of that. Mm. Mm. Because it, you can, you're connected to who you are as a human being, I think. Because of the endeavours and the physical aspect and the the engagement. You know what I mean? Mm. But do you understand what I mean by mm -hmm. that? Yeah, definitely. definitely. It, keeps, it keeps you connected to you, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, martial arts is a is a really great rapid way of getting back into your spiritual connection. Traditional martial arts yeah. as well, like like the samurai and you know what I mean. I yeah. believe in all that. Yeah, I believe in it fully because I've lived it, so I do believe in it. Yeah, and I, and I know a lot. I know it. I know it to be true. That's that. That's what the whole uh, the whole the whole the Aikido thing was was about. That that's what he was trying to do. He wasn't trying to create a new fighting system. Yueshiba Sensei was trying to say if we use martial arts almost like a religious discipline. It'll reconnect you back to spirit faster yeah. than any other religion it can is. do. It's, yeah. it's, 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 it's a soulful endeavour. Mm. Mm. But I've gone off track again. What were we, what were we talking about? I was, I was uh, tracking you, um, your martial arts career. To the boxing? To the boxing. Because uh, you were saying you were struggling to get a, a, a coach to Yeah, so to no fight. one would take me shit. I was 28. Do you know who Jimmy Albertina is? No. So he was he was, he was the Don at the uh, every Sunday. ABC. Okay. No, no, did he talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the great fighters that'll come out of each other mm. to Liverpool amateur boxing gym. But Jimmy Albertina was, was, the, head, was the head coach there. Sadly, nice. he's passed now. But uh, but he had a soulful spirit as well. He's the first one who introduced me to waterfalls. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? This, 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 this hard case boxing coach from yeah. the Thunder in Kirkdale in Liverpool, which is a rough ass part of Liverpool. <laughs> and there he is taking me to waterfalls. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the, 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 these people you meet throughout your life, you like, they just take you on a little different path than you think. And that waterfall he took me to in my early 20s, I used that as my sort of spiritual sort of reawakening. Mm. I go there on my own, I just get it, you know what I mean? Mm. I go there at the end of fight camps to just connect with nature. And mm. I wasn't really understanding why I was doing it because I was, I, was, I was a mid-20s scouser who'd by that time been sort of moulded by the fight world. You know what I mean? And mm. everything that goes with it in Liverpool, the mm. door work and all that. Yep. All that nonsense. So where I am this so-called RK Scouser mm. at a waterfall mm. doing meditation. You know what I mean? Mm. I was I was probably doing things a little bit before me before it became sort of modern as it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no yeah. social media, there's no phones, there's yeah, yeah. no no selfies. Yeah. But I was doing it. And there's a part of me that knew I needed to do it. Because cause we are cosmic scousers. For me, it's pretty sure. <laughs> oh, no. Don't get me involved now. But for spiritual expansion. This is what for, this is what people don't know. They they have this whole vision of Liverpool and it's uh, fucking Harry Enfield in a wig and the moustache and the fight. And there's a lot of deep down, people down. in this city. You know? There's a lot of deep people here, deep, man. Deep, deep, deep. Yeah. But I, th I think this is what's happened. I think social media... Mm. So what 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 I see from the younger ones is they are they are deep they are soulful they are spiritual, but the social media aspect is sort of it's corrupted at all. Yeah, yeah. Because people don't want to do anything now, and me included, by the way, I've, yeah. I fell into this trap. But you don't want to do anything, but I'll get an attention for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but again, what I'm trying to say to you is, before I was, I think I was 28 before a mobile phone existed. Yeah. Social media was way after that, but. Mm. You see how you see how where the problems occur. Yeah, don't you? yeah, definitely. I think I don't think these people are any less spiritual. I just think the seducement of mm. social media and and the, the the need or the desire to be noticed and mm. and accredited and 
given attention for what you do. I don't know. I'd like to think these people would do these things anyway. Mm. Pretty pretty much sure they would. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, what do you think on that one? Um, I, yeah, I think bit it's of a, both. I think it's I, yeah, I think it's a bit of both. I think it's a bit of both. I do, I do think that. Well, fucking hell, I've done I've done documentaries and two hour long lectures on the effects of social media and narcissism, and it's a poison. It's a poison. We're plugging we're plugging people back into the weakest parts of the human psyche, and who's stronger than that? You know, we we all suffer from it. We all suffer from yeah, it. Yeah, we've all we've all played that part, haven't we? Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. Um, but like. But like we're doing a podcast now, we're yeah. sharing stories. Yeah. And I hope I hope I'm conveying in my my own personal way that um I don't know. This is another medium, this is another form of entertainment, another form of um I don't know. It it is social media. I, I'm doing this with you today because I like you and I like to engage with you as a, as a human being. And um all other people are gonna see it. I don't know. It, it can think, be positive. I think it's important to, to sort of maybe share from a perspective that might stimulate someone else who's yeah, yeah. younger. It can be who's positive. Not, you might be thinking like this, yeah. Yeah. If you if you if you're disciplined with the social media usage, either as a recipient or as a content creator, it can be positive. Yeah, but I, we have to be disciplined. Super that's disciplined. A, that's a very key point. And I've realised yeah. that over time. And I've met some very good people over social media. Yeah. Some people I've never met personally. Yeah. But I've had deep, meaningful relationships with them on a very soulful level to yeah. messaging, to yeah. maybe phone calls. Yeah. And it's not, not to do with, like, relationships to do no, with, no. To, anything to do with sexual, not yeah, to yeah. do with that. Yeah. Just to do with people. Can be humans, positive. Connection. Mm. Realizing that no matter what part of the country or world, you know what I mean, mm-hmm. that there's, there's some very similar minded souls out there, mm-hmm. and it's nice to know that these people exist. Mm-hmm. Not only not only within your own sort of um, sphere of of, of locality, but mm-hmm. like literally across the world. You know what I mean? it, it's very reassuring to know people like that exist. Super reassuring. I've got uh, mates in America who I've never met, and um, during the whole the BLM riots and the darkest days of 2020. And I was like, oh, this is just fucking horrible. And I think just the, uh, America's gone this way. They they don't know. I've never told them. But they're, they're Instagram and YouTube friends. We go on each other's podcasts and stuff. Just chatting to them and just knowing they were there and that they didn't hate all white people really made a big fucking difference to my mental health in 2020. Because what I was being fed was black America hates every Caucasian and I started believing it. And then I'd, 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 we'd either chat or we'd do like a little WhatsApp video conversation and they were exactly the same as they always were. And I was like, I got something from that. They're not, I've never met them in real life, but that massively impacted my world. So even a man like you got sucked into that propaganda. Fucking hell, mate. 100, 2020 was a dark time for me. Dark, dark time. When I saw all that going off and the nonsense we were being fed nonstop, I was ha- it was heavy yeah. propaganda. Heavy, heavy, heavy propaganda. And from all areas yeah. about everything. <laughs> yeah, 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 about everything. But I wasn't I wasn't worried about the UK. I was worried about, I was really worried. My sister lives in America and uh, my yeah. nephews live there. I was really, really worried. And just having, like you say, that, that little connection, like even if we were just sharing memes or something, I'd be like, oh, they're still sharing memes with me. They don't fucking hate me. Which is a stupid thing to think. I know yeah, that. I know what you mean. You can read, you can read, you can see a lot. About how someone's thinking, to how yeah. they interact with you on yeah. social media. Exactly, exactly. You become very clear how someone's feeling or thinking. You, exactly, yeah. You you can actually read a lot in social media interactions. So I'm not of that position that says, oh, it's all bad. Connecting people is good. And I think what you said there is important to reiterate. Connecting people with similar values. So you can chat to somebody who maybe also believes in karma or maybe also believes in something that not everybody believes, like past lives or something like that. And have a conversation and go, you feel something. You're like, okay, I'm not on my own. I'm not totally isolated with these beliefs. That's important. I think there's a lot of information overload going on now. Oh, it's horrendous. Just, I've got to that point now where what I believe is what I believe. What I feel is what I feel. I've had enough life experiences with... So here's my thing about what you've just been saying. 
I've I've immersed myself in so many different cultures over time, mm. and it's all again come through mm. combat. Yeah. So if you if you train in a combat gym, mm. and like I've done for thirty years, mm. and you've mixed with so many people from mm. so many cultures, <laughs> so many backgrounds, and mm. so so many way different, but but in a combat gym, mm. everyone everyone that is a true collective. Yeah. If you're part of a combat team. Yeah. Like I was at the Wolf Slayer and my mate team. It was 40 mm. hardcore warriors mm. on the mat every day mm. from all over the country, from all over the world, mm. from every culture, every background, this every colour, every ethnicity, gym, isn't it? every this, every that. Yeah. Not an issue with anyone. Yeah. We, we were a band of brothers, do you know mm. what I mean? And you probably get that in the military mm. to some degree mm. before, you know, or after they got rid of all the madness to do with... Um, I'm not saying the woke military, by the way. The woke military. I'm talking about the military thing. that the, the know, ones who were actually doing a job <laughs> had a problem with people from different ethnicities yeah. in yeah, the past, yeah. and you know it's proven to be true. Yeah, but it ain't like that now. Yeah, but what I'm trying to say is, in a combat gym, all all things are equal. Yeah, the divisions aren't ethnic, are they? They're more like, are you a striker or a striker or a grappler? In an MMA gym, yeah. Yeah, yeah, in an MMA gym. That's the division. It's two races in an MMA gym, strikers and grapplers. You know what, you know what the Wolf Slayer MMA Academy was? Which one? That was, the, that was, it was established at the, at the at, I want to say established at, at the, the beginning of MMA, it wasn't because Hoist Gracie, by the way, got a, do you know what Hoist Gracie is? Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know why I took Hoist Gracie around town at the age of 21? You didn't. Round Liverpool, you took Hoist Round Gracie. Liverpool. Oh, wow. Hoist Gracie come to the UK to do a seminar in Bolton. Yeah. I was working on the cre remember the Cream Nightclub. I do, yeah. So I was doing security <laughs> there. So Hoist Gracie had just won the first two UFCs. Yes. And yeah. he just proven to the world that BJJ was mm. the number one fighting art because, do you remember the first UFC? There was like oh, he, a boxer. He, did it, he did it with a fucking gear on. So that's what I'm saying. So ev <laughs> every different combat art form. They were actually different. Was, it wasn't MMA then. It was separated, yeah. 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 So well, Hoist Gracie, on behalf of the Gracie family, mm. proved to the world mm. that BJJ was the number one fighting art. I think he beat mm. Ken Shamrock twice. I can't he did. remember. He did. I know he beat him in one number. Yeah, no, I think he got So twice. he was now, he was now a god in that in that world yeah. of martial arts. Yeah. He come to the Bolton. To do a seminar, we all thought we were going to like a street fighting seminar. Oh, okay, we've all turned up in Hugo Boss Taki. <laughs> <laughs> walked into walked into this arena, yeah. and every 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 man and woman, I think it was just men, but every every person in there was fully kitted out in the white gears with the yeah. black belts on, paying homage to this small Brazilian man, quite a small man, yeah, because he just proven to the world that they were number one, and what they did was number one. Got to the end of the seminar, doing all this rolling around on the floor, thinking, what the yeah. fuck all this about? Mobile phones had just come out. Right. Number. Hoist, I work in the cream in Liverpool. It's a great yeah. nightclub. Why don't you come tonight and have yeah. a good time? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man, okay, yeah. Never thought <laughs> nothing of it. At my sister's theatre. So hang on. My sister's two years older than me. I'm 40. She's 51. She was 30. Yeah, mid twenties. So it's their thirtieth birthday party. New, you know, new little Nokia flip shit goes. Oh yeah. Hi man, it's Hoist Gracie. We're at the Edge Day McDonald's. Where you at? I went. No way. <laughs> Phone down. Got an off. See you later. <laughs> when I met Hoist Gracie at yeah. Edge Day McDonald's. Yeah. Took him round town. Yeah. One of the other lads, Colin, who was there, and uh, no one knew who he was. Mm. Only one person who recognised him was was the female manager of the Cream Nightclub. And me turning in four hours late, yeah. that's what got me off and probably saved me job. Because oh. I didn't give a fuck. I oh, thought, okay. I'm going round town with this fella. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Didn't call into work. Just Nothing. turned up four Just hours up late, late with him next yeah. to me. Yeah, yeah. And she recognised him. Oh, Probably awesome. saved me job. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever go with the Cream Nightclub? Uh, I did once. I mean, it's been gone a long time, hasn't it? Um but yeah, years ago, years and years ago. And I was off my barnet when I went, so I don't remember much. It was a heavy club. Yeah, man. 5,000 people every week yeah. come to that club. Yeah. That's what I remember yeah, is just vast seas of people around. been the originator of a, quite a lot of things, but that mm. was what, one of the big things. Like the dance, dance, um, dance. The dance, dance scene, like yeah. The, yeah, yeah, yeah. The beginning of the, so being the UFC, beginning of, and the two collided. Yeah. 
Yeah. Gotta go faulty. Your, your man can share it for me. Is, is it? Is it? Uh, you and you and Hoyce. Me and Hoyce in the crew. Me and me dressed in my security gear. Both get on this. Yeah. <sighs> Again, I can't be perfect on the time. It was at least ten feet. That's the one, yeah. That's the one. Oh, he's a handsome but Before fellow. that, I'd gone round town him all night. So that's Hoyce Grace. You have to win the first two UFCs. Yeah. That's me looking young and. Look at my nose on that. Still had my nose flattened on that. <laughs> That's how young I was. Yeah. But um, have you got have you got the other one, Jacob? We're in the gate, that one. So see Colin there and Hugo Boss Tracky. <laughs> right, so that's how we've turned up for this for this well, for this uh, seminar. So that's in Bolton, that one. Yeah. Before we get to the cream in the night. And then Jacob is the another one with me stand up. That's the one. Jacob, you're good at this. <laughs> so that's Hoist Gracie again. Yeah. Looking baldy now at the wolf slayer that I've been speaking about. Yeah. Must I never started there till I was 36. So where where is Wolf Slayer? Is it St. It Helens Witness. or Witness? But he remembered me from that time in Liverpool. Oh really? Didn't know me saying anything, but he yeah. remembered me, Tony, tall yeah. fella. Yeah. The fella who brought him to Liverpool for this seminar yeah. knew me because he was one of the coaches at the Wolf Slayer. Oh, cool. Rang me, said, Hoy Gracie, I think he's asking about you. Yeah, yeah. Put him on the phone to me. And he made the trip up to the bus there just to say hello to me. Oh, now imagine nice. how many millions of people he's met yeah. since in that fifteen year period. Yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's he's a god yeah, in, yeah. in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Oh world. god, yeah, yeah. But I must have made I must have made a mark on him. Oh, that's nice. Because he remembered me. Yeah. Well, you take him around the city for a night. I'm sure, like very proud moment. Yeah, that's awesome. That is have awesome. you got? Can, yeah, I might as well go on to my next big one. Have you got the Tyson faulty there, Jacob? I said I wasn't going to do glory stories, but I am, aren't I? But fuck it. Go on, how did, how did you meet Mike Tyson? We'll get on this, right? So, no, but the reason <laughs> I want to say this, because getting back to what I said before, being that yeah. 12 year old boy, yeah. looking at Alfie. Yeah. Like, me, me life's a, like, seen the Forrest Gump film? Mm hmm. Where all these mad things happen to him over time, yeah, yeah. and he, they're not pre planned. It's just like, there you are. Yeah. These are things I would have dreamt about as a kid. Yeah. And probably the dream about Mike Tyson wasn't even current by the time I was thinking of starting combat but points I'm making is these incredible people these these huge huge stars of combat probably the most prominent two that you could probably imagine being Hoist Gracie and uh, Mike Tyson are a different combat sport but there they am spending time with them this was a private meetup I got with Mike Tyson how tall are you Tony six seven how the fuck have you made yourself look the same size as Mike Tyson? I've stooped down. <laughs> You've done a good but job. But the story there. behind this one, see that <laughs> gift bag in his hand? Yeah. My my One of my friends at the time was driving the tour bus that Tyson was on. So we right. drove him all around this country and got yeah. obviously got to know him to a degree, got yeah. to know his team, got to know the managers of the, of the tour. Yeah. And this is at the Devonshire in Edge Lane. So before he went in to do one of his... Is uh, Mike Tyson talks and meet the crowd and all that, mm. which he's probably done a thousand times. Mm. Shook hands of a million people, mm. autograph, you know what I mean? Mm. I went to the Asda and bought that gift bag for the quid, filled it with sweets and chocolates because mm. I knew I knew his missus and kids were on the bus because my oh, mate yeah. had told me. Okay. Took my own son Jude, who's one there, yeah. now he's 10, so it was nine years ago. Got introduced to Tyson in what they mm. call the green room, it was just yeah. some little back room in the yeah. Devons, yeah. yeah. This tour manager went, Mark, this is Townie. He's a good fighter from the UK. Yeah. Mike Tyson's walked up, chest eye to me, not even look me in the face. Yeah. Put his hand out like a robot. Yeah. I'm just another punter want, wanting the shake of his hand and an yeah. autograph. Yeah. As he's put his hand out, that gift bag, I've put in his hand. Yeah. I said, Mike, that's one that's respect one fighter to another. I know your yeah. missus and kids are on the bus. There's some there's yeah. some Candy. there's some gifts yeah. in them. Yeah. It's resulted, it's resulted in Mike Tyson not being asked about meeting me. Yeah. Couldn't give a fuck who I was. Yeah. Just another punter to that picture. Yeah. Yeah. Took me to the tour bus, introduced me to his family. Oh, that's nice. Why? Bit of thought. Bit of empathy. What? Bit of thought and empathy went into the yeah, because And maybe I was the first person in a long time not to ask him for nothing, but to yeah. offer give him, him something. Give him something, yeah. And it was you had a genuine it. respect. You yeah, know yeah, me? yeah. That's a nice thought. I'm not a sicker fan, me. I, res I respect him f f for the fighter he is. Don't respect Evan the bottom because yeah. he lived, he's lived a very mixed life, hasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, he's probably damaged as a kid. But the point I'm making is that, I don't know, I've, just got, I've got a skill for treating people equal. 
irrespective of... Well, not everyone would think of doing that. Not everyone would think, oh, his kids are there and, you know, this is... She's the like fam- the family man that he is. You know what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. That's nice. It is nice. But the point I'm making is, I made an impression on the two, but Mike Tyson, let's make, maybe Mike Tyson will come back in 15 years and has to see me. <laughs> well, he's, he's got his own podcast going now, hasn't he? Do you want another one? Go on. Charles Bronson's good mate to Mike Tyson. Do you know who Charles Bronson is? The prisoner Charles Bronson, yeah. Yeah, yeah they made a movie about him with... Um, Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah, with... Who, who played them? Come on now, Jacob. Who played Charles who Bronson? Who played Mike Tyson? It, not who played Mike Tyson. Who played Charles Bronson in the Bronson movie? He's the Very g- famous actor. Yeah, he's in Peaky Blinders. He's in Legend. He's one of my favourite actors. Uh, Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy. Tom Hardy played him. Do you know Tom, Tom Hardy spars with my, my mate's son in Liverpool? In uh, the Shankly. Is that Do you know Ken Wright? Yeah. As Tom Hardy down to this. Oh, is that why he was here? That's how the connection is, yeah. I but thought he was a friend and, of the James. Andy McGann, he was the owner of the Wolf Slayer. Do you know what, Andy McGann? Oh yeah, no, I don't. No, well, anyway, I don't. He's, and, he owns and he owns the Wolf Lair. And He's got a lot of connections well, right? but he got, he got Tom Hardy to spar with his son. You know what I mean? so, so he's a, so Tom Hardy's a friend of the guy who owns the Wolf Lair and Lawrence and Lawrence, yeah, and the Jim brothers. And as the, well, the, right? the the way that that came about was because Rampage mm. Jackson and the SAS had a link up. Tom Hardy was doing something mm. to do with the S. That's how it all links up. Ah, uh, okay, okay. It's okay. mad how the it's mad how the whales all just collide, isn't it? Yeah, because I'd, I'd heard Tom didn't Tom come up and do. Boxing refereeing here for a, a GM Brothers event, or I think the GM Brothers were fighting or something he's like that. Some, he's done some, yeah. some big some promo. refereeing and stuff. Yeah. Do you know who yeah. Rampage Jackson is? Oh yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What a character! So I spent a lot of time with him in America. He's part of the Bull Slayer team. I didn't know so that. He was a huge name in America, mixed mar- worldwide mixed martial arts. How could he be part of the Wolf Slayer team? Wolf Slayer. He is- come and lived in. He come and lived in in Witness. He come and lived Did with he? Anthony McGann and Warrington. Lived in his house. You're joking. Huh? Aren't they, aren't they Jacob, in... can we get the Rampage Jackson? Uh, Hang on, uh, isn't it? I, I I could be totally off base here. Aren't they doing catch wrestling? Isn't catch wrestling their thing at the Wolf Slayer? Have I made that no, up? No, it was full mixed martial arts. Oh, full mixed martial arts. It was arts. the original okay. uh, mixed martial arts gym. And, uh, I don't know if it's the original, but it, but it was, it was one the of the most famous. The most successful. I've trained with Dave Faulkner, who's out Dave Faulkner was one of my yeah. teammates. Dave was an amazing martial, mixed martial artist. So Rampage Jackson was on the same team as them for a while. So Rampage he? Jackson was... One of the original, not my team, one of the but he was mm. a UFC winner. Mm. He was a Pride champion. Yes. So he was a double champion in UFC and Pride. Yeah. Huge. He was a huge megastar in MMA at the time. Yeah. Um, and the Wolf Slayer signed him. Let's see where he is. I've got Curry as the athlete. That's Bisping. He is Bisping a muscular black the, gentleman. The fighters. There, the there he is. So that's, that's at the. Uh, that's at the the comeback for him to go and regain his title against John Jones at UFC in Colorado. So there's Anthony at the front. There's Tom on the right. There's Lee, one of the other owners. Um, Big Rob at the back. Czech Congo behind me. He was a heavyweight in the UFC. And Rampage was this was him competing against John Jones to try and regain his title that he that he'd lost formerly. So I wanted to, that's a good segue, actually. I wanted to ask you about this because I remember we discussed it one night when we were working the door. I really like John Jones as a fighter and you've you've already alluded to this. Do you think there is a responsibility to fighters to behave a certain way in their public? Like I, I say to people, I like John Jones. I think he's yeah. a great fighter. And they'll go, oh no, he's a cheat. He's a cokehead. He does this, he does that. And I'm like, well, he's not a, he's not a priest. He's not like a life coach. He's a fighter and I like the way he fights that's why I enjoy watching him fight do you think there's a responsibility for fighters to behave in a certain yeah, way as role models be a role model yeah yeah I do. listen I think John Jones is the greatest fighter that's ever lived oh do you really for this reason yeah because no one had his weight in any form of combat could yeah. ever beat that man he's proven that he's been the UFC champion for over 10 years do you he's, know what he's got a hell of a lot of fight intelligence hasn't he no but I mean to be to be a champion in that sport for, for 10 that years. long yeah yeah it's yeah. incredible yeah yeah so as you're aging and all the young ones and I don't at your know ankles, what assistance yeah. he's given himself to start. I don't know about that because what wouldn't. I'm saying is if, mm. if you just look at what he's achieved it's mm. phenomenal yeah uh, but to answer your question yeah you've got to be you got to be like a Lennox Lewis you got to be a role model so would you you've say got, all this gotta, stuff he's doing with his fingers out poking people in the eyes he shouldn't be gotta, doing that no you got to be listen if you're if you're given the, the, if you're given the blessing and that gift 
to to be so gifted, mm. to be so uh, worldwide renowned. You gotta mm. you gotta you gotta give the people who are rising above you something to something something valuable and something true. You know what I mean? Yeah. You gotta be a true ma. You gotta be a true martial artist. You gotta be a true competitor. That that Roy Jones wasn't true, but I, that's, I don't even want to speak about him. But he was one of the greatest boxers that ever lived. And Roy he, Jones. I, I, but. How did that go, the fight? But was that but pure boxing fight? He's, he's not a credible human being because <coughs> irrespective of our, our different abilities as, as boxers, yeah. it, 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 you, you still don't come to a city promised to put on, on a show which people mm. paid to go to. Mm. I train for nine weeks in order to prepare for yeah, and then just pull out without any reason behind it. it Probably because you got a better offer somewhere else. That's not the point. Mm. Still, you just don't do it. Mm. Mm. You act you're like... The responsible world champion and world renowned. Um, you got to, you got to just put, you got to, you got to be credible. You got to be a credible human being. Don't give. I don't care how much you achieve and how much money and how much this and how. If you're not a credible human being, then so, you, so don't really, you don't, you don't really mean. You, 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 not that you don't mean it. You understand what I'm saying? Obviously. Oh no, a hundred percent. You're not a credible human being. If, you, if you're if your virtues and your moral compass ain't mm. right, then what you achieve beyond that, it's shallow. Well, and it, and it's going to bite you in the arse at a, at a later date. Agree, you're going to know. You got to look yourself in the mirror. You got to lay your head on the pillow at night. You got to mm. know what you are as a person. So then, okay. So I'm looking round and I look at young lads. I look at young lads in in our club that we that we were working in, and I think I'm seeing a lot of Conor McGregor imitation here. There's a certain mode of being in the world. That seems to have come straight out of Crumlin, and it looks like these lads are doing it. I like Conor McGregor as a fighter. Would you say that that he's been a good role model for people? Oh, not not in terms of like what I'd want my children to aspire to. I'd yeah. want my children to aspire to what he's achieved as a fighter and the dedication and the commitment the and the, yeah. the drive and the mm. the self belief. <clears throat> but but it, 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 and. It's the salespeople behind them, possibly, pushing that, wanting that. Um, but, I, but I've seen enough in the fight game at, a, at the high mm. levels, at that level, mm. Rampage mm. level, that people become shells of themselves. I've stayed at Rampage's house in the Hollywood Hills, beautiful okay. home, all yeah. the trappings, all the luxuries, all the yeah, all yeah. the fame, all the fortune. Mm. Seen it with other fighters in the boxing world. But I've seen the careers end as well. And I... I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to them. It's not always, it's you're not always, you're not always speaking to someone who's lived, lived the life that you'd imagine they've lived, because something seems to, to have been lost within them. It making sense? It makes sense. But when you look at someone like Lennox Lewis, mm. who I don't know him personally, but the point mm. I'm making is, you see what you see, and you see how a person carries himself, and you see, you still see what you still see, you still see what's in their eyes, you still see. The words you still hear the words you speak and the and the intonation you got behind the words you just see how they carry themselves and he left the sport on mm. a high. He never he never he never succumbed to the trash talk and the bullshit and mm. the nonsense that that got. But he was but he was an impeccable fight champion and he proved himself as a fight champion without all the sales and nonsense because he had that ability to 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 be the best without having to. So, Without having to lower themselves, to yeah, that. yeah, and I think the best never have to lower themselves to that. I think the odd few do it. Nazim, Nazim was a great fighter. I loved Nazim, but he, but he saw he, he, he sell the souls a little bit. Don't they he? do, yeah, and and the scene sell the souls to the men in suits and the, the money. Like how much money is enough? But it's got, how much fame is enough? Hasn't it? How much this is enough? How much got that's it, enough? It's got to come from the individual as well. I cited Conor McGregor, but then actually. You could go back because Nassim was a big hero of mine growing up for for boxing. Nassim was probably more a, a, the originator of that than the style, that whole swaggering, the, yeah, the swagger trash talking. And the, I, look, if you're living on benefits and someone's offering you the world, but I do, I do honestly believe that part. I believe it's a blessing in the case. I believe throughout the journey of that craziness that he must go on, it must be hard for anyone to withstand that mm. level of fame and money. Absolutely, when yeah. You're from okay. nothing. That yeah, thing. no, you're right. And I'm half, I feel bl like I'm nearly fifty now. But if I look back to my life now, even though I wanted them things, mm. even though I wanted that fame and that fortune, mm. 
I'm very glad that never happened mm. because I, I definitely wouldn't have learned who I was mm. with all with all that with all that buffer. Mm. Probably would have been a lot longer in my life that I would have had to learn who the fuck I was. You know what I mean? But I, I probably learned who it was because of the frustrations of not achieving the things I wanted to achieve. Yes. I wanted them things and I never got them. So I've, I've had to go, th past in my past life, I had to go through all the, the frustration and the hurt and the pain, but realizing, was it that important anyway? Yeah. Probably not. You said you watched fighters peak and then they lose something, which was really interesting. It really made me think, what, what do you think they've lost? Part of the soul, really. I think you. Can, I do believe. I do believe in the, in the, in the theory of like you can sell your soul. Mm. I believe people in Hollywood sell their soul. I believe people in the music industry sell their soul mm. for gain, for gain, for gain. There's a lot. There's a lot of documented sort of people call it conspiracy. But I think again, if you look, if you look at some of the facts, you think mm, seems to be a lot of truth in this. Yeah, come to me, Richard. Come to me, mm. dangle, dangle. How much yeah, do you yeah. need? How much do you want? How much yeah. this? How much that? How much is enough? It's because I, I, I've sort of looked at it and I've gone, well, I'm, I'm 44. I've had a pretty good, varied life with a lot of experience, and even now, I look at some people coming up, whether it's sports or whether it's music or acting, and I just think that must warp your fucking mind to get that rich and that famous that quickly. That's like taking heavy dose psychedelics every day if it didn't make you a bit weird that would be strange if you didn't change that would be a, a strange thing unless you've got a solid family ground with good people around you mm. i think i think we'd all like i i probably i probably would have ended up losing the plot you know yeah what I, mean? I like to think i wouldn't mm. but i don't know you know what i mean have you ever lost the plot no, what I'm trying to say to you is I never achieved that level of fame and fortune. I was on the cusp of it yeah. a few times mm. in different con but until until you until you're recognized by the public, mm. by the masses, it doesn't mm. it doesn't matter how much it doesn't matter how much you'd achieve, how respected you are as a combatant by other combatants, unless yeah. you're getting that unless you're getting that fame and that that, that accreditation by the media mm. and by the media then filters into the masses, doesn't it? So if, if you if you're chosen as as the gold, as the golden child type of thing because of the because of your swagger, because of yeah. your ability to please an audience. That's what it is. It's entertaining. Which a lot of fighters haven't got that ability. Yeah. So sale ability, mm. fight ability, mm. go hand in hand. Mm. I've seen a lot of top level fighters mm. without that sale ability. Mm. I was a top level fighter without sale ability. The amount of um, but the amount of fighters you've got sail ability mm. as well as fight ability mm. but then there's people who've just got the total and utter level of fight ability that you don't need the sail ability you understand what I mean? 100% some people need both some people haven't got both yeah some people can get a forward one yeah or the other yeah um, and then the, the argument well it's a it's a it's it's a it's not just fighting anymore. It's a, um, it's an experience for the fan. It's a, it's a, it's entertainment, isn't it? It's entertainment. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, so, and it, it's something else. To a then. point, it is, but it, I'm, I'm old school. The, 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 well, this, okay. So maybe what we've actually been talking about is there's two different models. So say you keep it old school. It's martial arts. We're a warrior class. That's that. And I'm of the other school. I'm not actually, but let's say I'm of the other school. It's like, no, we're entertainers. So I'm like a, a football star or a basketball star in America, which means I can feature on a rap video, which means I can show up in a Ferrari. Which, do you know what I mean? It's, mm. I'm crossing in the, over. I'm crossing over. Cross-contamination. Cross-contamination, <laughs> exactly. I, I'd, I'd never asked you this before. You, you think in, people are corrupted along the way? You have to be. I think, I think you have to be, but I wonder, <laughs> I think it's latent within the human being themselves. They have to have something in them. That's open that's to so, being corrupted. Yeah, something that you remember is, is, is not corrupted. Yeah. Like your family. Your, yeah. Something. Something need, that's they're... being instilled in you. Because you've got to block an awful lot of stuff out. Did you Did you ever, um, I, I actually don't know this about you, did you ever fall prey to uh, drugs or alcohol along the Apart, way? So. You've never lost the plot. I, I, lived, a straight, I lived a straight life most of my life. There's two, there's two times when I've, I've gone off track, mm. party for like 
a few years, like mm. two or three years. Mm. One was one was between me being a child and an adult. Mm. So like six, 16 to 19 mm. and, and partying. Mm. Um, got five kids and the young mm. kids, so I'm going to be careful what I say, but I went partying. Mm -hmm. And then got my shit together. Mm. And you new being a successful combatant yeah. with what I wanted to do. Yeah. After the time my life worked. Yeah. Um and then it was thirty seven when when I went to like a divorce relationship that went off mm -hmm. track again. Mm -hmm. For obvious reasons. You just lose the plot a little bit, don't you? Yeah. But um and then and then regained myself. So they 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 were the two time the first one was a young man's experience of life, which you yeah. just do. Yeah. I don't forget, I've been from 12 to like sort of 16, 17. I, I, I was Straight dedicated. Edged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I wanted a bit of freedom and stuff. Um, found my way in the world that way. 37 year old one was just like me having a, a midlife crisis type of thing. Just, you know, yeah. Relationship breakdown, mm. moving away from my children, mm. so all, all the things that go with that. But again, lessons. But I've gone down to have two more children with a new partner. Mm. Yeah. Life works. Life yeah. works if you learn from your experiences, doesn't it? Definitely. If you don't use them as a um, as a weight to sort of keep you yeah. keep you muddled and mixed up in what might have been or what could have happened or full of regrets and, and all that. So yeah. me me pointing out these things to do with like uh, the combat experience I've had with mm. the with the people who were who were world renowned to some degree. Again, it goes back to what to where I started. That's what when you asked me the combat question. I'm mm -hmm. I'm twelve, and I've had an amazing life experience through combat and through all the all the honourable mm. good things that come <coughs> through. Excuse me, committing yourself to that life. Do you mm. know what I mean? Because it's it, it's a it's a formidable sort of commitment. Yeah, it takes a lot to commit to that life. Oh God, I, and I committed to it fully for thirty years, and I'm still committed to it now because I'm a coach now. But it's in a different way. I, I've got. To, I've got to ask you: What age were you when you first started grappling? Because obviously, you've done your karate, you've done your boxing, and then you move over into MMA. So learning grappling must have been so that hoist Gracie experience in Bolton with my first ever. Well, you're rolling around on, your on back. the floor, thing. What the fuck? What the like, fuck is I, this? I, I, I had like a sort of like, oh fuck that. No, I wasn't even. I wasn't even. MMA wasn't even on yeah. the radar then, as yeah. it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was, I, in, no, it was, I know, in, it was on VHS video recorder. You were twenty. I would have been sixteen. We had VHS. You should watch it on yeah. the VHS. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The old UFC um, videos. But yeah, my first real experience of, of grappling was going to the Wolf Slayer at 36. Yeah. So I was a formidable striker at this time. I'd, be a, I'd been a boxer, karate yeah. guy. I was formidable I've, as a striker. I've sparred with him. He is a formidable striker. My forehead can tell you all about it. But, but grappling, as they call it, the shark tank, it's like yeah. taking the line into the water, putting, you know what I mean? It's a different thing. All different. But I'm gracious enough to accept that. Yeah. This is a whole new world, and this yeah. is a world I need to learn about now. Yeah. Um, did you did you enjoy it? Yeah, but I was thirty six, and BJJ didn't suit me as an individual. Right, BJJ, it's a beautiful art form. Yeah, but for me, wrestling, wrestling stroke yeah. striking is, is yeah. the way I would have yes really developed. Because it was, it was, the but there was no full time wrestling. Yeah. We had Mario Sukata at the, at the uh, Wolf Slayer, and he's a, he's a he's a yeah. fantastic um, master of BJJ yeah. and also a great grappler he's been in the UFC himself yeah. but the focus was on BJJ more than wrestling right um, the man who we've mentioned he's going to become the podcast when he comes to the UK again uh, was it Rico Rodriguez Rico Rodriguez yeah. so yeah. they used to bring him in for like two week spats of a time yeah. and he, he was he was an amazing wrestler okay sort of my height and under him a blossom because I was just I was just made for wrestling because it's yeah. a domination sort of sport. Yeah, I I couldn't go from being a dominating striker to being on my back looking for subs. It didn't work for me. No, that makes sense. A hundred percent, mate. I, I mean, just, I, I, just I would put, have been amazed if you'd said to me, "Oh yeah, I took to BJJ like a fist just, of water." I'd be like, I found, I found it so difficult. Yeah, you know yeah, what yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was what you call a top game fighter. I yes. wanted to do. I wanted to. I was. I was just made for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably through striking, I was made for that. Yeah, yeah. Man. You cut. Yeah, it's, um, it's a different mindset. But I never well. had enough time with wrestling coaches to really develop me. Right. Really develop me game. 
And I had I had opportunities and there was there was loads of opportunities that Anthony and Leith the Wolf presented me. Mm. But they believed in me and I was I was formidable. Yeah. I was um but at age was taken by. Yeah. Age was taken by. And maybe they took that out the balls. The other they had Bispin there, the other they had Rampage. Yeah. The other they had Czech Congo. These were these were high level stars, you see. Mm. But as a striker, I played with these these were USC fucking stars and I was yeah. playing in the gym I was playing as a striker I was playing with them yeah like which I 100% believe but I th- but my grappling ability wasn't enough to to, to get not yeah, enough yeah. for me to make it in the gym wasn't enough for me to keep developing my career yeah, so yeah. I was having a win a win a loss you know what I mean so I was yeah. getting subbed occasionally no one had strike me no mm. one had stand and strike me mm. but I, I get occasionally beat with a sub mm. And that'd knock me back. So I'd I'd be getting my UFC, my UFC chance would be five wins on the run. Mm. Maybe get the three wins, loss, mm. have to start again. Yeah, yeah. yeah By yeah. that time, it all just it all just fell apart. Yeah. But I wouldn't have been ready for the UFC anyway. No, because I didn't have I didn't have the grappling ability to to, to deal with. Would have I would have met an American wrestler. Would have it would have been grappler beat to strike at every time. Every time. Every time. Every time. And there's that, yeah. Especially a wrestling. We're, we're, we're sat here as, as two strikers predominantly, and that's just the sad yeah, fact. I've got a great respect for grapplers and yeah, I've trained with some amazing yeah. level Especially grapplers. when they dump me on my fucking head. <laughs> Top level. But yeah, until until a striker experiences being pitched up in the air and put, yeah. do you understand? But, until, yeah, but yeah. also on the flip side, until a grappler, BJJ enthusiast, yeah. Get it on the chin. Yes. Horses, yeah, yeah. for course. That's, yeah, that's yeah. why mixed martial arts is beautiful because. Yeah. You can't live with a false sense of security. No. You're going to experience everything. Yeah, yeah. You're going to ex- tie boxes, out for tie boxes. So yeah. you've experienced an, a, a leg kick, an elbow to the face, and yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Horses, of course. Do you know who Steve Morris is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Karate was his big thing, wasn't based it? In, yeah, Steve Morris is based in karate, but mm. that man is just like, he's in the 70s, you know. Have you mm. come to a seminar I've put on with him in Liverpool? No, I was, at, I, was, I was out the country last time he did that, yeah. Steve Morris is like, he's the ultimate. And he's teaching MMA now. He, he just teaches combat. He, he does just, his, own, he's his just own thing. A, he's just a master of combat, but the man's in his 70s and he still mm. moves like he's in his 20s. It's incredible. And he still do damage to you like he was in his 20s. His uh, his writing, his essays on martial arts. Unbelievable, isn't it? Are like, uh, they're at like PhD. Nobody's in his league for writing about martial arts. Like I read his stuff and I'm like, fuck But he's up. lived there as well. Yeah, people. When I say to people, this man, it it literally kill you yeah. in seconds. Yeah, and he's in the seventies. He look yeah. like you're not. Yeah, but he yeah. would. <laughs> yeah, the man's a the man's a Goliath when it comes to combat. We're in uh, coming up into the last sort of eleven minutes of uh, of the podcast now. I wanted to ask you about how you got into uh, door work and how how security how, how nightclub security has changed because it has changed a lot in the time that you've been doing it. How did how did you originally get into door work? Because getting back to when I was younger, that was that was being a combatant or being a footy player, and yeah. being a combatant meant you worked on the doors. Yeah, so just, every every credible man and every hard case in the city at the time. Yeah, worked on the doors. So so ju- just to be clear, if you're coming from from Liverpool, the two the two ways out were really you're either going to do it through football or through boxing, martial arts. Security, well, yeah, but the, like two, the the fighting goes on. That if you're if you're a capable fighter, yeah, you're you're then sucked into the door world, aren't you? Yeah. So, Dave Ash, one of me me great gurus of martial arts back in the day, um, he was, I think he was at a competition. I fought I fought one of his students. Um, mm. We ended up becoming friends. Uh, another friend, Chris Duff, he was part of that that regime. Robbie Brown, another, another friend. But these were all people who. I was a bit of a loner, mate, to be honest. Mm. And when I say a loner, I didn't really mix with other... Fa- I, this this is how I sort of... It's the best way of explaining it. I got into fighting at, at, at a mid-teenage age, but my course as a human being was already set. And mm. I was I was an empathic, I was a compassionate, soulful human being who cared for other people. Mm. So me then taking that fighting ability and transitioning it into another world where you weren't acting all the things I've just mentioned. Mm. And some people use fighting and the ability to fight to to make their way in the world, don't they? And they put it on others and they make others succumb to their 
to their ability. So back in the day in Liverpool, Bully, bullying press, before guns, mean. fighting ability was what? Yeah, yeah. Put you up to peck and order. Does that yeah, make yeah. sense? Yeah. But like said Dave and that, he was a he was a, a man of my ilk, but an older man in his his mid thirties. I was in my early twenties, mm. and he took me under his wing, and he, he taught me a lot about how to interact in that world, how to carry yourself, how to because you, you how, were, how to be young. a man, yeah, but without being a bully, yeah. Does that make sense? What, what, what age were you when he was doing that for you? When I started on doors? Yeah. So when I went to Alfie's and then uh, I was 21, met Dave at a competition. I was with Alfie here, but I fought mm-hmm. one of Dave's lads at a competition. Mm-hmm. Dave took me under his wing. I was still with Alfie. Ended up working for Alfie on the cream. This, that. It's just like, it's just that connection, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Funny enough, Dave Ash and me. Mm-hmm. And this was the... Um, I think Chris Chris was there as well, and this 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 Goliath of a man from uh, from Newcastle. Mm-hmm. We all come to the, what's the club you were talking to Lawrence about that you worked on? Uh, Mosquito. I'm telling you now, it was you. Was it? Because there was two doormen on this door, and the four of us has walked up, right? Yeah. And you, it's either you or you might have knocked us back. Yeah. Because it was it was the time when that was like the in place, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah, probably... we, 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 we would have done. <laughs> if, you, if you looked even vaguely Andy, there was just no fucking way. Yeah, and the, but I was with these three, three monsters, you know what I mean? Yeah. I was thinking, this this might... But because Dave's the type of man who's mm. very, very capable man, but he's also respectful. So you know just some little posh wool knocked you back. Did you let no, that happen, say, no, Tony? Say, Did you fucking was, let that happen? It, it, it was a t- you I, remember, that. I remember it being a tense moment. <laughs> I remember it being a tense moment. But that's where... That's so where it was a fucking tense moment for me. Never but mind that's where, you. No, but that's where my innate sort of nature kicks in because yeah. I'm always the mediator in them circumstances. Do you understand what I mean? Was it, was it Mosquito or Living Room? Mosquito was the living downstairs. Room. Living Room. We went up the stairs. Uh, it, it was a very posh place. Yeah, Living Room was a fucking nightmare to get into. But I remember it being very tense, but I remember me mediating. Yeah. Because even though I was younger than them, yeah, I've always been a good mediator. Yeah, I've always, I've always. Was, was this around two thousand five, two thousand six, something like that? It was definitely. Yeah, it would be me. You, it definitely it looked like you. But it remember, would, it would fucking be me. But you were. I'm not that, sorry. You were fronting that door, weren't you? Sometimes they they had me fronting that door. But um, right? and I was only off, young. I've gone off track again. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, but yeah. So started with Dave. Started working for Alfie the Cream. Stayed at the Cream for like nearly ten years in a Tay Day. Had a break. Uh, met the Lynch family. You know the Lynch family? That's who I worked for first. The Lynch Oh, yes. Yeah, so Capital. For, yeah, yeah. So Anthony, who's John's son, is, is the one that we, we work for on, yep. um, on these Liverpool night spots. Yeah. But they're very credible family. And when I, when I come back to the doors in 2015, um, got got connected with the family. Um, we just cl- quickly connected as human beings and, uh, and as... And it's credible human beings, you know what I mean? I like Because they're for a them. tough, tough breed of men, mm. the lynchers. Mm. And, uh, and and I, I'm that type of man, but I've always been alone. Mm. And I, I've had no brothers. I've had mm. no, I've had no gang type of thing. I've mm. just I've just done my own thing. But I've mm. but I've proved myself in, as a man in, yeah. the, in, in the world, I suppose, mm. with me credentials as a combatant. Mm. Also. Maybe if you want to say out on the street, but only ever in an honourable way. Mm-hmm. Never bullied a human being in my life. I've never mm-hmm. put a, I never put myself on anyone in my mm-hmm. entire life from from whatever age. Never ever done it. Mm-hmm. I'm proud of the fact, you know, man. I've carried myself well in the world, mm-hmm. and and I and I get I get respected for that. I know I do, and the and the Lynch family respected me for that, and mm-hmm. they, they they helped me they helped me grow as a, mm-hmm. as a human as well because. He supported me. John's John's a very good businessman. He helped me open a gym and he gave me a gym and he, he supported me. He mm. supported me and helped me yeah. move up in the world, in the world that I was ready to make a step from the homeless work that I worked in. And they give me an opportunity, give me a gym in the centre of Liverpool, mm. give me responsibility to manage his doors mm. and his uh, security team on his clubs. Mm. So all these things mean a lot for me, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because these are people who've, Seen the best in me at a time. Dave, one of them. Alfie's another one. Mm. So I've had these people throughout my life when when I've needed it most. You've Steve Ennigan's another one. Mm. Got another great man in my life named Walter, mm. who's like a mentor and a guide. And I know I offer them something too because mm. they tell me. So it's, it's it's a win-win. Yeah, yeah. Yourself included. Uh, uh, Lawrence Lawrence Eastman, you know yeah. the 
he's another good soul. Yeah. And all these young lads who were, who were up and coming but have got the right attitude mm. and the right morals. You've, you've got a lot right, of nice young right lads ethics. around you, yeah. yeah. Some of your faces, are, they're, they're dead sound. They've got a good attitude on them. Yeah, good people. Yeah, George. I, I like to think of myself as, 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 a, as someone who, who acts as a role model. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I like to think that. Mm. And I believe that to be true. And I get enough reflections of it. So to me, the combat life has been, it's, it's, it's been the way it's, I've been moulded mm. to be a man in the world. Mm. But I've also got that family support that's taught me the, the right way to carry that. And it's, yeah. the two have combined well for me. How, uh, how have you seen it change, the uh, nightclub security world? Have, have Do you think it has changed since security when you... Security world? Yeah, <laughs> since you started. Since um, the introduction of the SIA badge, oh, man, has it been yeah. improved dramatically? Well, look, we've, lo <laughs> we've lost a lot of... We've lost a lot of... Um, I'm not saying it was always good the way it was. Cause no. It was, a lot, it was a big gang culture back in the yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And which, the, which big, did the need biggest gang won. Yeah, I mean. yeah. So, like, um, I, don't, I don't know if I agree with... I did, the call out, you know, let's let's have it right. It was like, it was gang culture. It was gang, yeah. And there's some big gangs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's yeah. some heavy, capable men yeah, yeah. who were in gangs together. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that can put a lot of fear into people. I used to be working on the cream, which when Alfie had it, mm. was a great team. Mm. But then Alfie had to lose it because of legal situation. Mm. But he kept me because he liked me. Mm. But from having a very strong team, mm. They whittled it down and employed mostly students, big students, rugby rugby mm. types. Mm. But these these No, it's not gonna it doesn't matter. What I mean. It doesn't matter. They, they crumble big, at the These so big rugby boys. Probably work them matter. working on the weakest store in town. Right. But with the biggest numbers of people coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had no backing. No. That's but fucking. The reason dangerous. they stayed <laughs> and the reason they probably suffered the indignity is because they allowed me to at least bring three or four of my capable friends who yeah we worked as our own little unit right we supported each other yeah but um you weren't gonna let each other die but, if it went badly wrong but as a, but as a, as a full team of 25 dormant yeah, yeah i'd yeah. say there's probably 10 who were capable but sometimes 10 is enough to stand up to yeah. 40. yeah yeah but on the flip side wasn't doing the call out so i wasn't getting involved in the darkness mm. not for me mm -hmm. i mean Mm. I I live I live life based on what I believe to be to be right. You know what I mean? Mm. I'll never get sucked into someone else's. I'll be there. For, I'll be there for anyone I love, but I'd mm. never get sucked in to what I consider wrong. Mm. Does that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. You just got to. I'd only ever go to prison it. for an honourable reason. Right. That's be, I could only I could only lay my head on the pillow if I was there for an honourable reason. Yeah. And there's many ways to end up in prison when you yeah, work yeah. with those. People yeah. are looking for excuses. Hundred percent. Looking for excuses. I I don't think I don't think. I think it's very hard for people outside of that world to understand just how many rapid routes to prison they're fucking. Yeah. <laughs> like you've got to fight, you've got to work quite hard. You are actually. a ma you are a major target of security. hundred percent, hundred percent. With the age of phones and all that. Yeah. But look, I can't. The way I carry myself in the world is how I carry myself when I work on the door. I, yeah. I don't change. Yeah, yeah. At all. Yeah, yeah. You don't get some big fucking attitude on you when you put no, a badge on I'm, and a black I'm jacket. Me, I'm me in. I'm me in the gym. I'm me yeah. in. in in a kids' party, when I take my children there to play, yeah, do you understand what I mean? It's much I'm safer there on a that family way. occasion. It's much I don't safer. Change my, yeah. I don't change my yeah. persona. This is this is what I see some lads and the way they act on the door, and I'm like, Liverpool's small, the world's small. I might see you in the Asda, you know. <laughs> it's happened. It's happened. It happened in New Zealand. Two lads trying to batter me in New Zealand, and then I saw them in the fucking. Uh, they call them dairies over there, the little supermarkets. Anybody can get caught out. It's better to be humble and to be the same person in the Asda as you are on the door, I think. You've got to be authentic, haven't you? Gotta, it's just safer. You put up a big front and all that. It's just, it's not, it's, uh, it might work. You might get away with it for a couple of years, but fucking hell, when it goes wrong, it goes. So what have we got out of today's conversation? The world is not always a beautiful place, but it's still worth fighting for. I don't know. I like that. Do you like that? That's a good finish, though. <laughs> Is there anything uh, you want to mention before we start wrapping up? Is it, Should I send people over to your Instagram, maybe? And... No, I'm good with that. But one thing I would like to mention, the place that I work at now, Mazda Gym and mm. Concordia Clinic. Yeah. For anyone who's looking for combat training, I'm a coach there. Okay. It's a, but it's a great gym, nonetheless. Alex Foreman is, is the is the uh, proprietor. Um, the most caring man I've ever met when it comes to looking after his fighters. So anyone who's looking for a combat career, 
uh, it's Thai boxing based. Yeah. Mixed martial arts based. Which I'm one of the coaches there for. I've also got Rob Aspilic and Cordia Clinic for anyone who's after any holistic uh, healing yeah. treatments. This man, I call this man Jesus. <laughs> he does, it's Chinese You've medicine. Rob, and stuff. Yes, I have once. Yeah. The man is a healer extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. So And it's a great gym. Really well equipped and again no, I've I've touched have I touched lucky or is it all just being down to the way it's meant to be? Yeah. What you give out, you get back. And I finally got to that place where um I was I was with John, John Lynch, who mentioned there is Jim, mm. fantastic. I was with Derry Matthews, another great human being in the mm. city. He gives a lot out and gives a lot to others as well as any fanfare. Yeah. Then I've met Alex and Rob. And I've moved there because of the clinic, because I like to do the holistic sort mm. of, uh, I believe in holistic, natural health. So combination wise, it's all just led me to this place. Yeah. And there's, there's not more I need, there's not more I want. You're happy there, yeah. That's it, simple. Simple okay. credibility, authenticity, good people. Not on more, not on less. The right values, mate, the right values. Listen, thank you very much for coming in. Really appreciate Pleasure, it. Pleasure, brother. And uh, hopefully we can do this again if you're up for it. That hopefully see awesome. you in the gym or on the door soon. Oh, go <laughs> away. Ladies and gents, thank you very much for your time and for your attention and look forward to speaking to you again soon. Cheers.